Hey guys, welcome back to the Cyber Hub Engage podcast. We are still live at RSA here at the beautiful Georgia booth, just getting all peachy. I got David Vaughn with me from, well, first, thank you for your service. Thank 22 you. years? 22 years. U.S. Army, way better than Air Force, Micah, way <laughs> better than Air Force. It's all one team, one fight, right? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> just hold the mic a one, bit closer. One team, one fight. <laughs> one team, one fight. <laughs> <laughs> we love it. But you're also aboard of the International ISSA, yes. uh, and you've spent the last year in the private, finally in the private sector. Yes, yeah. So I uh, was a CISO in the U.S. public sector for a services company. Uh, unfortunately, we uh, decided to go different ways, and uh, I found myself in banking. Right. So uh, banking is <laughs> night and day different right. from U.S. public sector. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, I think uh, in banking, the the primary concern. You know, security is important, but right. compliance is more important, right? Because that has the most immediate, tangible consequence. Bottom line yeah. impact. Yep, bottom line impact. So, uh, you know, trying to uh, help gear them to, you can be secure and compliant, but you can't be compliant and be secure, right? So trying to put that training hat on. So there's this thing that, you know, we interviewed a system for a big manufacturing company here in the States. Um, what, when was Alex Tan? Like three months ago or so? Like Christmas time. Yeah, yeah, Christmas time. And one of the things he said is he goes, CISOs need to explain to the board and the board needs to understand that security comes first, compliance comes second. If you have security, you're going to be compliant, but you're not necessarily going to have security by being, you're not going to necessarily be secure by just following compliance. Well, so, and, and, and I love that, but, uh, and I'm not saying this is indicative of my organization, but what I see across the banking industry is often you'll have somebody that's rated on availability, right? Uh -huh. And that person is not responsible for security. Then you have somebody that's rated on security and not availability, and they they think that one another is after each other. One another is going to impact each other. So as a result of that, you get consensus management, right? Which becomes an Achilles heel right. to the organization. So and it it stints uh, innovation. It stints it impacts security. Uh, and uh, at our organization, we're disrupt or die. And our CEO, uh, that's his mantra right now, is disrupt or die. I know that at bb and you guys have just made a brilliant move. I'm not going to ask you about it because we already said you can't talk about it. Uh, but you guys did steal one from Georgia. Yes, yes. You, the guys did steal one from Georgia. Um, we would call it theft, though, right? We, uh, the, the, call, the proper call, legal term is it is a merger of equals, right? So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we are uh, coming together as a merger of equals to form one new co, new company that's going to be the premier financial institution. So whatever that name ends up being, uh, I'm excited about it. Me too. I think we're, we're. I think one of the most exciting parts of it all is is just the fact that you're starting to see the banking consolidation kind of take place, but it's smarter than it was 20 years ago. It seems to it be. Has to be. Well, it yeah, has to be. We, we've got to learn lessons. <laughs> Yeah. Being in the military for 22 years, you're wearing a bronze star, obviously. So, again, bronze stars for bravery. Yes, yes. And, yes. and, and that's a very, high, it's, it's a very high merit that isn't awarded to anyone. Um, and, you know, I'll ask you about that a little bit later. But when you're seeing, you know, one of the things I was talking to someone about last week was the fact that I, I feel like the, the private sector doesn't utilize the trained military personnel that goes that can come into cybersecurity and really upgrade that readiness, that preparedness, and that crisis management. I don't know if I'd really agree with that though, because and right now, <laughs> that's kind of a problem. Is that the private industry, uh, both private and public industry, is uh, taking advantage of the cyber assets from the military, right? So all branches right now, there's not really a uh, an additional service obligation. Right, so if you look at somebody getting assessed into the cyber branch within the army, um, there's a 24-month block of instruction, block of training that all branches, regardless it's Air Force, Marines, whatever, Cybercom has said this is what you're going to do to become cyber. Right, um, so once you finish that, you're then going to get missioned. So whether you're a reservist, whether you're a guardsman, whether you're active duty, you're going to go out and do a mission. Right, and that's generally the first three years of you being in the cyber branch. Right. So let's just say you signed on for a four and two. So four years active duty, two years, years call up, right? Right. Uh, so if I just chewed up three years of that, you've got one year left, you're dealing with 
military sock, which, you know, all branches have their own sock, right? Right. Uh, and then a bank comes along and says, hey, I can give you this dump truck full of money plus a pension and uh, benefits, and you don't have to play Army anymore. And then a reservist like me in our command, we can say, hey, you don't have to play active duty anymore. You can be a reservist. Still, the only legal game for hacking in town is with the U.S. government. Still do that once a, day, once a month as a reservist, but you can also make real money in the civilian world. I, I definitely see that as being exploited right now, big time, big time. That's that's a new trend, maybe. In the last, last five years. I'd five say. years like or five so? Years, yeah. Are you seeing more veterans now in cybersecurity units within organizations than before? Oh, yeah. Definitely. Absolutely. Without a doubt. Um, I mean, the, I think my, my biggest crux right now is with 8570, right? So right. that is the single most um, damning thing to the cybersecurity industry, not just military, but abroad. Um, and I actually had a, a, the pleasure and opportunity to meet the gentleman at the COG6's office that wrote 8570. And uh, I uh, had a lot of questions for him, right? Like, you know, certifications don't make you an expert. Um, and uh, I, I'm definitely uh, proof of that, right? I have a lot of certifications the Army says I have to have. Doesn't mean that I'm an expert on every single right. one of those things, right? Um, it definitely makes me equitable. Right, uh, those certifications make you hell. Out. Well, and in, in, in the private market, it gets your pay higher because no, yeah, all these does. different certs yeah. check yeah. different marks. It's yeah, it's definitely. more money in your pocket. But you know, um, maintenance of those certifications, uh, maintenance of that individual, right? Just because you got your CISSP ten years ago, how how do I know that you're still an expert in those domains that you excelled in? Right, like uh, uh, for me, uh, CISSP was like a rite of passage. I failed it twice. <laughs> by five points in the same domains, never had the same question on my test, right? And I, I took the paper-based test, you know, back in 2006. But um, I had, uh, was getting ready to deploy in 2009 to Iraq, and uh, I reached out to Sean Harris, and I said, look, uh, I can't afford your training. It's like $4,000. I'm getting ready to deploy. I said, uh, you know, could you offer me a military discount? And Sean replied back to me almost immediately saying, uh, send me your address, that's all she said. I sent her my address, and she overnighted all of her training gear. And in it also had a handwritten note that said, I want you to uh, let me know two days that you're available. I'll make myself available, and I'll mentor you on all the things that I know about CISSP. And I, I think that uh, she was probably one of the, the game changers in training because she used her real-world experiences. Right. And and that's how that's what got it for me, right? And... Uh, when she passed away, that was a that was a huge heavy hitter for me. She was such a good person, and uh, I started a scholarship through ISSA uh, in her uh, memorial, and uh, we give that out every year to can uh, people donate to that? Yes, they can. Yeah, so uh, where we do have, they go? We have a ISSA Education Foundation. Uh, they maintain in uh, uh, the the Howard Schmidt uh, Education uh -huh. Foundation and the uh, Sean Harris uh, Memorial Scholarship Foundation, and so. Um, and those, those they so people can go to, can go to ISSA org ISSA and look at the yep. scholarships that can Absolutely. donate to contribute to the foundations yes. and whatnot. Yeah. And if they uh, join to become a member, uh, as they're going through that process, they can choose to make a donation with their membership as well. So you know, it's it's, it's all about trying to you know get the membership um, and increase the community that we are um, trying to help. The community of information security professionals that's desperately needed yes. where do you see the cooperation in the private public sector get obviously it's getting a lot better we're right next to CISA and you know being CISA's new uh, directive in homeland security that was an amazing accomplishment they've been well, fighting I mean, for that for years I mean all they did is they changed the name and made what they actually do made the name fit what they were doing because they were like the NPP TPP something it's beforehand. a little bit more than a name change though because now they have authority now they have. But that was teeth. before the name change. That was the new directives that sure, came from sure, President sure, sure. Trump. I'll give you that. Yeah. The, but you know, it's without that authority, nobody took them seriously, right? So the the name change was a family friendly. You know, this is well, something there. It's like a DNS name, right? It is. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've made it. They've made it. They've actually described what they actually do. Yeah. I think um, people now know how to engage with them than they did before. Yep. It's become easier. But how do you see that partnership building up? I mean, where, where you, you know, you're coming from the the U.S. Army, where you did cyber for for years. 
obviously there's there's a lot of information sharing on that realm with all the different agencies but how do you see where can we get better as a nation because you know we talked about china and russia and a lot of those different countries offhand we can even look at our allies places like israel where the government and the israeli cert is heavily involved in yeah. defending a lot of the businesses and in the u.s you know our view of government involvement in business isn't as it is in israel or other places how do we address that privacy challenge and the need to really have more eyes than just your own kind of watching that space that's that, that, that that's something such a, imminent doesn't a big happen. question right i mean um if you look at things like uh nist right they established a nice framework right, right. that's a good start because a lot of people they come into this and say i, I want to do infosec i want to do cyber but i don't know where to start right and uh the nice framework was a great place to point somebody to and said hey this gives you a crawl, walk, run of what it is that interests you, right? If you want right. to be uh, an analyst, it's, here's the KSAs, the knowledge, skills, and abilities that support that, and here's the milestones that get you from being entry level to being the master level. Uh, but you know, taking that all the way back to the beginning, when do you think that came out? This is a small trivia question for you. And if you know the answer. Micah, do you know the answer? Uh, I know the answer to this. So. So what do you think started all of this, right? So what started this with CISA? What started the NICE framework? What started all of this? Nope, no. Well, so in 2007, uh, a national security presidential directive signed by George Bush Jr., right. President George Bush Jr., um, established the term cybersecurity. It is the single most important document uh, for cyber with government that exists and nobody ever talks about it, right? And, and a lot of times those presidential directives are on high side networks, right? Well, we had PPD-20 under former yep. President Obama that a lot of people felt was ineffective. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that was reversed by President Trump, I think within the first 90 days or 100 mm -hmm. days of his administration. But well, so a lot of people though thought that that cybersecurity directive was what established bulk collection. So right. an organization called Epic sued, they won, and uh, the government released a redacted form of this presidential security directive. It's, uh, I can't remember the exact number, I think it's 23 or 54 or something like that, but uh, it is actually what defines cybersecurity and all of the things that you see now, Cybercom, our cyber, CISA, uh, 800-53, those were the agency responses to that presidential directive. And it's happening, and we're seeing the tangible evidence of this. But what happens when you start seeing all these block building things that we're seeing, just like you mentioned, information sharing, right? So our allied partners right, abroad might have better insight on things because they've been doing things and reacting to things a certain way for a certain amount of time. Well, How do you share that information? Well, legally, there's we have to jump through more obstacles yeah. than a lot of other nations. Yeah. I mean, Israel, in the name of security, has a lot of different laws that allow them to, I mean, just last week, um, about 10 or 12 Israeli information um, news sites were breached and had the, you know, Jerusalem always belongs, to, will always be the capital of Palestine with a hashtag of the hackers that took over about 10 news, sor news sites at the height of the evening news, right? I mean, we don't see that happening here per se, but in Israel news is a very you know, it's, it's part of your day. I mean, it's, it's you wake up in the morning, you listen to the news, you, you, every hour on the hour and every radio station in the country, a, a two, three minute news broadcast comes on. Very different from how we deal with information here. And, and I think a lot of that just goes to not being aware, right? Like the, the average American doesn't know the struggle that Israelis face every day. Um, the average American's never been to an Israeli airport where they carry submachine guns, and that's that's common, right? Yeah. And and you know, if I saw that, I'd feel safe and secure. Uh, I know when I was in Paris, I saw soldiers with submachine guns walking around, and that was their patrolling. But that doesn't happen here. It's just like when I was in Kuwait and I saw uh, women wearing full burqas. You know, everybody in the mall was wearing a full burqa, right? That doesn't happen here, right? Like a, a, a Muslim female wearing a burqa fills out a place 
doing that here because of the stigma behind it, which is unfortunate. Which, right? which is a whole other kind of, I like to call it one of those where you see the challenge of culture versus, yeah. I mean, I think that's why when, you know, someone asked me uh, about six months ago to go, why do you think Israel is always kind of leading the way in security, whether it be airport security, cyber security, you name it. I go, well, when someone's always trying to kill you, you're always finding ways to overcome it. And, and I, I think, though, um, what is a prime minister's name? Netanyahu. Yeah. He, he was a game changer for a lot of stuff in Israel. So, you know, the fact that the government backs companies and, and, and encourages them and rewards the behavior and it basically acts as an incubator, I think the U.S. actually took some notes from that. We did our own incubator uh, it's with DIU so right. defense innovations unit and with futures command I think you'll see more of that I, I heard something uh, a couple of weeks ago with an organization within the military and I, I won't name the names but I uh, I heard that from prototype to testing to getting an acquisition made and getting a, a, a tool in the hands of, of the people that need to use it was 45 days and that is mind blowing because I've been I've been doing this for a long time, right? And I've I've seen procurement cycles take eighteen months. Well, when right? you look at even like the contracting procurement for simple things in in in, in, in any form of the military, yeah. I wrote a paper for DLA, um, and it was about how do we use blockchain and troop deployment in the cloud, APT. All the other buzzwords, right? Like well, everybody wants to use the buzzwords. It's well, a blockchain. <laughs> well, we, we were. <laughs> those are drinking words, sir. Th those are drinking <laughs> words. We could talk about AI, machine learning, and so many others. Yeah. But I think there's there was a, there was a paper that we were asked to write that specifically addressed the fact of how can we use blockchain to better manage our troop deployment sure. and supply chain. How do we make sure that those guys really, you know, get the right weapons, get get the right access, and so forth? And the the it took six months to get feedback on that paper sure i mean but with something like blockchain though right the first thing you got to ask though is are we playing buzzword soup right do you, why do you think you need this x technology what problem are you trying to solve and I, I think that's what i really enjoy about the concept of of diu and uh some of these other incubators that are working with the government is they start with the 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 Simon Sinek that it starts with why, right? They start well, why are we doing this? What are we trying to solve? When you think of DLA, right, and their and their their role in our in our in our force, they're essentially our logistics department. Sure. Yeah. So one of their bigger challenges is always ferrying things across and managing the flow of troops in and out, food in and out, supplies in and out. Furthermore, they have to comply with so many different aspects of it, including their contractors. So they're really trying to do multiple things simultaneously. Yeah. And so, but they also need to have it in a kind of a secured environment that allows vendors. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and everything from, from the procurement process all the way across to delivery. You got to have some control and oversight on that process. Well, on that I mean, prospect. it'd be argued from any loggy that would tell you that it's because of the logistician network that we're able to project our power anywhere in the world. Right. And what makes us one of the greatest countries on the planet. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and logistics is huge. I mean, look at the, uh, the, the horror ordeal going down with this naval base. Right. Uh, and uh, forget the, the, the company's name or the country's name, but uh, the, the fact that that country might be turned over from Britain to the, the original owners means that we've got to renegotiate with them. And if we don't renegotiate with them, then that's that's problematic, right? So. Have you seen in, in your role? Have you often seen, you know, going into the private sector now? How have you seen that kind of? How do you see the mentality change between public and private? Are you seeing private view security different than the military does, or is it kind of the same mentality and just people aren't really getting it? I mean, I mean, where, where, where are you seeing the cyber mentality head towards? Cyber mentality heading towards, I, I see some improvements, but there is a night and day difference between public sector and private sector. Um, but there's different driving forces, right? Like, just like you mentioned with your Israeli uh, right. comment earlier, like when somebody's trying to kill you every day, you operate a different way. You think right. a different way. You work a different way. And I, it, just like what I'm learning in banking as I'm getting started is when somebody's trying to steal from you every day, you find a different way to operate um, and you try different technologies. But when you're bound by a compliance requirement, right, you're kind of hindered 
by that very requirement in how fast you can move to do something, to try a new technology. So um, it, it, that's the differentiator is that I think U.S. public sector has learned to become more agile um, and uh, where budgets haven't always been the, the, the concern, um, whereas in the private sector, budgets are our number one concern. Um, I've, I've seen arguments where um, a CISO didn't want to invest $10 million a year anymore in a DLP solution because they hadn't had a data breach, right? We hadn't had one, so why do we keep investing this money? We're burning money. That's not the right way to think, right? Uh, that, that, I think that's <laughs> the difference between private and public sector often is there's not the same kind of attention or understanding. If you don't know how the bad guys are going to come at you, you're really not going to know where you need to spend your money and you're resources. Playing whack -a -mole. Right. Yeah. yeah. You're pretty much saying, okay, what's the trend? You can walk around RSA and figure out, oh, that's a good solution to have. But if no one's coming at you that way, you don't really need it. And, it, you know, the thing, I love RSA, but, you know, RSA has just gotten too big, right? Um, I have spent all day today in this expo floor and have not even gone through all of it, right? And, and what you're missing out on is that new company, that, that the new technology. Like, right. I love the fact that they break up the the countries. Uh huh. Right? Like, so you can see the technology coming out of Israel. You can see the technology, technology coming, coming out of yeah. Canada, Canada, out of all these yeah. different places. I mean, who knew they did Infosec <laughs> in Canada, right? I mean, uh, to my <laughs> what, friends you, in uh, Tel. You there. didn't know a boot Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've got friends in uh, um, the, the Toronto, Toronto and uh, Vancouver. So just a little jab at them, but uh, they they do great things in Canada, uh, but uh, you know, you always got a good, good, good jab when you can. <laughs> well, I think that is the role of any American to take a jab at a Canadian. <laughs> but um, they'll apologize for you. For right, doing they'll it. apologize for yeah. us saying it, yeah, right? They'll yeah. be like, oh, they're we're so sorry. Kind. We're so yeah, kind. They're so nice, so nice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's why we love them. Um, but we are running out of time. I awesome. do want to thank you for hey, coming thank on, you. David. Thank you for having Thank me. you for your service, thank man. You. We really do appreciate awesome. it. Cyber Hub Engage, we're here at the Georgia booth, and in about an hour, we have a great reception here, so make sure you come by South Hole 1665. Stop it by David, the great David Vaughn, and uh, we'll be back uh, right after this.